Welcome everyone. It is 3 p.m. and it's time for the server room show. This is episode 31. We will continue the history of BSD. We left it uh, uh, the last time, part one, we finished, where we mentioned that uh, Ken Thompson, after finishing his sabbatical in Berkeley, he goes back to uh, Bell Labs and he prepares the 50 changes tape which were uh, 50 patches to apply to your Unix kernel to make it work better. C a tape which Billjoy obtain, obtains and, uh, and applies uh, these patches and then he starts rebuilding the kernel and that's how he learns building kernels and so forth. And we mentioned that he did a lot of editing while doing this work and he found that the ED editor had a lot of defiances he found EM editor written by uh, George Coluris of Queen Mary's College of London. And uh, Bill Joy had a rule, uh, one of his first rules, that never spend a lot of time coming up with a good idea when you can steal a better one. This is where we left uh, episode 30, part one. So now we continue with episode 31, uh, uh, which is part two of history of BSD. Most probably there will be a third part, as you will see that there is still a long, long uh, story ahead of us to recount. Uh, Bill Joy then hacked on the EM editor and came up with the EX line-oriented editor. Berkeley at that time did not have any screen-oriented terminals. They had ADM3 line-oriented dumb terminals only. And Bill was very good at deciding what the problem was and finding the shortest path to, to solve that problem. And uh, by this moment, Bill uh, had now two interesting uh, pieces of software, uh, and he put them. Um, he, he could put them together: the Pascal interpreter and the EX editor. He combined these two into the Berkeley software distribution, shortened for BSD later, uh, still called as One BSD. He distributed about 30 copies of these tapes, starting February 1977. He was very good. He was very good in multitasking. Uh, he was uh, being a graduate student, doing distributions, uh, sending out mails, answering the phone, hacking on the code, and uh, and yeah, he was he was very good multitasking uh, person in this. Berkeley, after a while, did obtain some ADM3 screen addressable terminals. It meant that you could move the cursor anywhere you wanted on the screen. Bill took his EX line-oriented ori line editor and converted it to a screen editor, and that is how the V editor was born. However, he did not want to create three different versions of his VI editor to handle ADM3As, ADM3s, and, and uh, DAC printing terminals. So he came up with uh, something called TermCap, which was uh, terminal capabilities. It, isol it, it isolated some of these characteristics into strings, uh, dynamically configured the editor based on the terminal you were using. On the downside, this allowed terminal manufacturers to create any strange screen addressing they wanted, knowing they can just write a term cup entry uh, for, for this to, to work. And it resulted that the term cup file grew into a monstrous size. Bill finished working on VI, However, it was never actually finished. It was just good enough for what he and the people around him had to do uh, with the editor. He didn't like the burn shell either, uh, written by Stephen R. Burn while at Bell Labs, and the way it worked. He didn't like that. He wanted something more C-like, so he started working on the C shell. Uh, Bill was a graduate student in programming languages. Meanwhile, he did an update to the original Berkeley software distribution and he called it, as you can guess, 2BSD. He shipped about 75 copies starting in June 1978. 2BSD was the last distribution done by Bill Joy for the PDP-11. However, there was continued interest in PDP-11s, so other people started backporting the work Bill was doing on the Vax to PDP 11s, which led to the releases such as 2.1 BSD, 2.2 BSD, and so on, eventually leading to the 2.11 BSD release, which still ran on PDP 11s well into the 1990s. By 1978, the Berkeley Computer Science Department has begun to make a name for itself. 
which Esper Kirk McCusick was thanked to Bill Joy and his work. As a result, they had enough grant money to buy the latest machine from DEC, uh, VEX 11 780, delivered in 1978. It was one of the first ones of the assembly line. They wanted to run Unix on this machine. They obtained a copy of Unix uh, 32V, a fast and dirty port of Unix version 7 for the PDP 11. It had no virtual memory, no, pagi no paging which limited them to 128k in size, just like on the PDP-11. Limited, but it got the VAX up on Unix. The PDP-11 was limited to 128k text plus data. The VAX was limited to the amount of physical memory on the machine, minus the memory dedicated to the kernel. The, department VAX the department's VAX 11-780 was fully loaded with 2 megabytes of memory, so the user process was theoretically limited to about one and a half megabytes. Uh, the problem was that the people who had spent a lot of money on the VAX uh, did so because they wanted to run Vaxima, a differential equation solver uh, written in Lisp at the time. The problem was that in those days when you typed Lisp, uh, as soon as you got the prompt, you were using uh, up to a megabyte of, uh, of RAM and as soon as you typed anything, uh, anything else, uh, apart from lips, Lisp to getting the, the prompt, you were up to two megabytes. So mm, you can see that as soon as you started doing anything, memory usage went up from there. And uh, as, as I mentioned, this machine had uh, not more than two megabytes of memory, this Vox 11-780. Unfortunately, uh, yeah, this machine had only 2 megabytes of memory, so users couldn't do anything useful in Lisp with that. They needed virtual memory. Uh, VAX VMS operating system had it. Luckily for them, uh, Bill Joy comes to save the day and tells them that he could get virtual memory working in Unix on the VAX, and he said he could do it uh, over the four-week Christmas break. He was given until the first day of classes in January, uh, otherwise DEX VAX VMS would be used as an operating system on, on the VAX. So you remember the first rule of Bill Joy, never spend a lot of time coming up with a good idea when you can steal a better one. Um, another graduate student, uh, Ozalp Babu Glu, had just uh, hacked together a virtual memory system for his uh, PhD thesis. And Bill uh, took this and hacked it uh, into into something so he would use it on uh, on Unix. Uh, Bill was not concerned whatsoever that uh, Ozab's virtual memory system was far from being finished. Unix 32V and uh, Virtual Vax Unix or VM Unix, uh, called Virtual Memory Unix, uh, the name which was given to this uh, to this hack. Uh, hacking virtual memory uh, of uh, OZAPS into, into Unix by Bill Joy were up and down uh, alternatively over the course of the break period. VM Unix was up more and more as the weeks went forward and was up by January 18. It was a bit rocky for the next couple of weeks. Lisp, Lisp now worked uh, but slowly, however it was not the fault of Unix. Uh, the reason was that the users were trying to solve differential equations using 10 megabyte of virtual memory on a 2 megabyte of real physical memory. So they were uh, very, very hardly overcommitting uh, on their capabilities, so to say. With this newfound success came the necessity to port all of the utilities from 2BSD to the VAX. By this time, Kirk McCusick shares an office with Bill Joy, and he is drawn more and more into the works of BSD. Once all the ut utilities were ported, Bill Joy and his office peers, uh, Peter Kessler, Robert Henry, Kirk McCusick, and a few others around the department, had their first complete system. A kernel, the utilities, everything you needed to load into bare metal hardware and just run it. They released it as 3BSD. Uh, as a remi reminder, from 1984 to 1996, uh, Bell Laboratories is called AT&T Bell Laboratories. Bill Joy is still a graduate student, still hacking code and doing distribution, but now a new problem is rising on the horizon. 
the distribution 3 BSD includes also 32V code, Unix 32V, which is um, the property or, or from AT&T Bell Labs. Previously, the distribution just included code that had been written at Berkeley. Now that, inc now that it included 32V code, licensing was in need. Billjoy took all the calls which came into the shared office. However, uh, as you can imagine, uh, as per bill, this license verification was just a verbal confirmation. About 100 copies went out under these terms of CDBSD starting in December 1979. These 100 copies meant about 100 different organizations, uh, resulted of each copy deployed on multiple systems, major universities, a uh, few companies and research groups. As this system 3BSD is more widely distributed, a lot, a lot more people begin to get involved in it. Initially, a 32V license cost around uh, $99, $100, which rose to around uh, over $10,000 uh, later in the course of, uh, of, of as this story goes forward. I also included uh, two links I found from original documents scanned from 1983 to 1984 showing Unix system V license prices and it is interesting to see the astronomical rise those Unix licenses uh, fees went through. I couldn't find more uh, uh, original scan documents uh, around these 32V licenses unfortunately it would be nice to see how AT&T got greedier and greedier uh, every single time. This is how the CDBSD licensing worked in this scenario. The organization would buy a BEX uh, machine, the hardware. They would purchase a 32V uh, license for it and then immediately run uh, 3BSD on their system because with the 32V license from AT&T they, um, they are allowed to run 3BSD which contains 32V uh, code as well apart from code written on Berkeley. As a result of this wide distribution, more people started hacking on the code, resulting in more contribution to come in. Autoribot, also known as uh, Autorestart, became available around this time. When a machine crashed, it could automatically reboot itself. Uh, it sounds very trivial today, but uh, back in the day, uh, previously when the machine uh, halted, someone had to restart it from the console. It was in part made possible uh, because of the first versions of uh, FSCK, which meant that after a crash, there were no need anymore to a computer guru to manually run file system checks and clean up comments on the file system to clean it up. It finally became to be possible to operate 24 seven, which meant the system could go into uh, heavy production. One of the early Lisp systems was coming out around this time also thanks to a program called Deliver Mail, the predecessor of SendMail, both created by Eric Alman, it uh, became possible for the first time to have email travel between two different machines. When Eric Alman rewrites Deliver Mail into SendMail, he decides that you probably shouldn't have to recompile your email delivery agent every time you uh, want to make a change, uh, uh, want to change something, a parameter. So it means that deliver mail originally had every uh, everything compiled into it and uh, thanks to send mail and the configuration file uh, now you could reconfigure it on the fly without recompiling the whole thing over and over again each time he also made it work with the smtp internet uh, protocol all these changes mentioned above plus improvements to the file system and some other bits and pieces were gathered all together and released as 4BSD starting in October 1980. About 150 copies of 4BSD were shipped, however not all had to be handled by Bill Joy. The university noticed that something big was happening out of this graduate student's office. This resulted in the university lawyers to start to sniff around and they decided that license verification was not rigorous enough. Um, who would who would thought that it was not rigorous enough? Bill Joy was doing it, and when someone said, "Yeah, yeah, yeah, I have a 2032 v license," he he believed uh, believed uh, the people. Many of these above uh, uh, activities uh, resulted that an administrative assistance was hired to do license uh, verifications. 
and uh, these activities and these uh, new hires were possible uh, because new funding was uh, becoming available, uh, actually driven by VEX VMS, and the funding was coming from uh, DARPA, the Defense Advanced Research Agency. DARPA as an arm of the Department of Defense was coordinating the research needs of the various arms of military, Army, Air Force, Navy, Marines, and so on, and uh, was funded by these various branches and it was supposed to determine which projects were worthy of funding and which branch of the military should fund which project. Projects were supposed to have some bearing on military readiness. The situation with the military was that they had uh, many projects going on, they were running on different hardware, they were using different operating systems, they were using different programming languages including assembly language and they were all using legacy proprietary systems. This resulted in that nobody could share results or programs with one another. DARPA was going to decide on the following. Uh, they were deciding on a certain computer, a certain operating system, and they would get everyone they were funding to use this system. So when they developed something, they could share it with the other groups or branches. The machine with the best price performance for the size of grants they were dealing with was uh, the VAX. There was only one question remaining, that uh, which operating system to use. Should it be VMS or uh, Unix? VMS was the initial favorite. It was written by the vendor, it was supported by the vendor, and clearly you could get support if you had uh, issues. However, the researchers wanted Unix. Uh, David Kashtan decided to resolve the VMS versus Unix matter. He was then at the Stanford Research Institute. He was also a DARPA grant recipient, interested in helping to select the hardware and operating system to be the basis for the standard. He wrote the famous VMS paper where he described the results of benchmarks he ran on both VMS and Berkeley Unix systems. These benchmarks showed severe performance problems with the Unix system. He developed kind of, uh, we would call them micro benchmarks for example, how fast can you do a get PID? How fast can you write a byte back and forth over a pipe between two processes uh, to measure context switches, uh, switching time? And he ran these micro benchmarks. He came up with both on the VMS and on the on the Unix system, and the performance was better on VMS in all cases. So, because of performance measurement and vendor support, he concluded uh, that they should standardize on VMS. VMS and the VAX hardware. Bill Joy received a copy of David Kashtan's paper and uh, he went very, very, very uh, angry and it uh, propelled him to, to decide to speed up the benchmark cases in, uh, in Unix. It resulted uh, a lot of tuning. He created specialized code, optimized the assembly language and so on. He did every little bit and piece he could to to do good performance on uh, on these uh, made up mm, benchmarks, so to say. And he was able to make all the all the benchmarks run faster on Unix than VMS, except for the context switching. Through surreptitious means, Bill and his associates were able to determine how VMS did context switching which resulted Unix doing the context switching benchmark uh, the same speed as VMS did. Bill Joy then brought a rebuttal paper. He trashed the validity of the benchmarks, but he then showed that Unix was as fast or faster in all the benchmark cases. This resulted in DARPA funding work uh, at Berkeley uh, began about June 1980. Bill were commissioned to ship the work they had done to make Unix so fast on these uh, bits and pieces and tuning optimization, uh, performance tuning and code, opt or code optimization. As these were made as proof of concept, some time was needed to make it uh, ready for production. Auto configuration had to be added so that PSD recipients uh, did not have to know how to build a custom kernel. Bill Joy added additional things including auto configuration written by Robert Eltz at the University of Melbourne, Australia. The system could look around the hardware present and configure it, therefore, specific configuration didn't have to be compiled in uh, to the kernel. 
The performance tuning and auto configuration came out as the next perk release and they called it 4.1BSD. People at AT&T were concerned that the name uh, like 5BSD could be confused with System 5, hence the switching to using the 4.x uh, format of uh, name for the release. Around 400 copies of 4.1BSD were shipped starting in June 1981. At the time AT&T was shipping the following Unix version 7, uh, Unix 32B, Program as Workbench, System 3 uh, created early 1981, uh, which was a combination of version 7, 32B, Program as Workbench and Unix support group tools. The thing is that none of these offerings of AT&T uh, ran particularly well on the WAX none of uh, these offerings of AT&T had uh, virtual memory mm, in it. Therefore AT&T would sell a uh, System 3 license, which they got very good money for, and then the buyer uh, then get immediately a tape from Berkeley with 4.1 BSD to run on the VAX. DARPA was pleased that Berkeley shipped their release 4.1 BSD in only a year, however it was promised in uh, four months. It was still very fast compared to other DARPA contractors. As a result, they decided to award another contract to Berkeley, this time to get uh, networking into Unix. Unix already had networking um, of, of a sort uh, with UUCP, Unix to Unix uh, copy, but uh, DARPA obviously had bigger plans. DARPA did not trust uh, a university or academics to do something as critical as implementing a protocol stack, for example, uh, something as complex as TCP IP. DARPA decided uh, Berkeley to design an API for accessing the networking and create de device drivers for Ethernet controllers. To implement TCP IP protocol stack, DARPA contracted BBN, Bolt, Berelnek, and Newman. DARPA set up a steering committee to oversee the development. In response to the DARPA contract, uh, Bill Joy wrote the 4.2 BSD architectural manual. It took him a couple of, couple of weeks and it described everything that would be in 4.2 BSD, including things like MMAP, which was not implemented for another eight years. Everything was to be implemented in one year, as per uh, Bill Joy. The manual included the networking interface, included uh, function prototypes of the socket interface, accept, connect, and so on, and uh, at the level of man pages. It gave descriptions on how the system calls would be used. Uh, Bill then went and asked BBN for a copy of their code so he could uh, test his interface. Rob Gurwitz from BBN provided a pre-release version of the networking code to Bill. The environment where Rob Gurwitz made BBN's networking code consisted of mainly VAX 11 slash 750s and 56 kilobyte lines. His network code uh, saturated a 56k line with 100% uh, uh, of CPU use on a VAX, VAX 11 750. At Berkeley, however, they had uh, 3 megabit uh, Ethernet lines, the latest and greatest from uh, Xerox Park. Doing bulk uh, data transfer between two machines connected with these 3 megabit line, uh, when they used BBN's code, uh, the throughput was uh, 56k. This resulted in Bill Joy hacking, hacking, hacking up the BBN code uh, completely. As a result, he was able to saturate the 3 megabit Ethernet line using only 90% of the CPU, which was a big achievement. Many people wanted to start testing the interface, so the system was informally distributed as 4.1a BSD starting at April 1992. It was basically 4.1 BSD plus the networking code, actually an alpha release, but it uh, proliferated widely. At this point, Sam Leffler joined the group. He came from a company that had a networking product. He had an advanced degree in computer science. He saw deficiencies in the networking interface, which he corrected. Summer was approaching, and Kirk McCusick asked Bill if he could work on some project during the summer, while he also worked on his thesis. Without getting into mm, 
details or much details for these little nuances and anecdotes on how the FFS file system came alive you have to watch Kirk's DVD of History of BSD nevertheless this little side project of Kirk's resulted in uh, in 18 months of the FFS fast file system which took Bill's original prototype file system into a release ready file system which went into 4.1b BSD uh, release in a form of test distributions in June 1982. As a result of the new file system FFS and the 4.1b release, Bill Joy uh, funds Kirk's trip to Unix conference in Boston with the help of the DARPA funds, where he went on stage uh, probably uh, one of the first times and talked about the file system and you can see thanks to his uh, numerous lectures and presentations that he never really gave gave up ever since he seems to be enjoying giving lectures and presentations and uh, they are really great fun to fun to watch the team at berkeley had put together their unique system bill joy and sam leffler had revised the networking and the ipc code the interprocess communication code uh, however Bill suddenly became interested in separating the code into machine dependent and machine independent parts. Uh, later on, Bill Joy shared with uh, Kirk Nakusi that uh, he was thinking of going to a startup called Sun Microsystems. The idea was the following mm, they were going to take commodity Motorola 6800, uh, 68,000 sorry, microprocessors and run uh, BSD Unix on them. As a side note, a number of small companies were selling 68,000 uh, based uh, boxes already, but they were running a variant of Unix from uh, Santa Cruz operation, SEO, SEO Unix. After Bill arrived, uh, Sun was able to ship BSD as per, uh, and as per uh, Bill, uh, BSD Unix will be so much better than uh, SEO Unix or, or, or any other offerings. His marketing pitch was that uh, it's an open system, commodity hardware, commodity software, and if your vendor is not satisfactory, uh, you can go to whomever is cheaper or better, and uh, people will buy into this, and Sun will sell a lot of systems. And Bill Joy was trying uh, hard to convince Kirk Nakuzik to join as well. He was telling him that uh, all the nice things can could happen that he could get a single digit employee number and uh, great stock options at Sun. Eventually Kirk Makusik didn't join to Sun. He had his own reasoning behind it which he explains in detail in his presentation on history of BSD DVD. After 18 months uh, Kirk finished his PhD. By then Sun was a big company. He did however uh, was the first uh, hired consultant at Sun uh, by Bill Joy to port the Pascal compiler, which was written in assembly language. Kirk completed this work together with Peter Kessler. Personally, mm, I don't know why, but uh, I would have loved this uh, story uh, in, in, in real life to turn out that Kirk actually uh, joined Sun and, uh, and to see all the great things he, he could have achieved there. But uh, but it didn't happen, so perhaps there is an alternate universe out there where it has happened, where Sun uh, drive through the 2000s, and an alternate universe where Oracle doesn't exist, and where Sun deck uh, compacts still the big names in IT. This pre pretty much tells you what I think about HP and Oracle, but uh, more about Oracle than HP. And uh, this was all for. Uh, for today and uh, as I said mm, I'm more than certain that there is gonna be a part 3 I will be try hard not to have a part 4 but uh, as you see there is a lot of uh, lot of history to share and actually I, I omitted uh, parts out from the history I, I omitted the TCP IP wars and the uh, lawsuit for those people who know how the, how the story continues I'm very happy that I, I got the permission, uh, written permission to do this and, uh, 
and and I can do this because it was uh, one of the things I I knew I wanted to do when I started this uh, this podcast. Thank you very much.